Proxica has a wonderful uh, set of chapters on data management SOPs or SOPs in general and she has a very nice appendix, Appendix B, that outlines the more common data management standard operating procedures and gives a one or two line description of the scope of those documents. So in general, you want an SOP that covers every task that you might find yourself doing. So if you are creating a data management plan, you want an SOP that tells you how to create that plan. If you have a data management study file, you want an SOP that tells you how to maintain that study file. So really, much like the working instructions and the project specific instructions, if you do a task, you need to have written documentation for it. What happens if you have to create an SOP? So far we've talked a lot about SOPs that we're going to assume are already in existence that somebody else has written for us. But if you join a new company or you are part of a company that is deploying a new technology or a new system, you might have to create standard operating procedures or participate in that creation. And when you do, you need to be thinking about content and also scope. So for content, an SOP really needs to say, what your task is, who does it, when it happens, how it's done, and what proves you did it. So going back to our data entry example, you might have an SOP for data entry that tells that the data entry operator will perform the task and that it happens um, as soon as the data is retrieved from the site or created at the site and that it is done using a access control validated database and that at the end of the data entry process, you will be able to run listings to prove that the data was entered correctly. So scope, we've talked about before, but I want to touch on it again. Um, with SOPs, your scope is really at a high level. You're going to define what must occur, but you're not going to give detail about how it is done. So data entry again, you would say all data must be entered, but you would not describe the data management system that you would use to do the entry or the project specific policies that would be employed. Proska has a nice little quote. She says, SOPs need to provide enough detail to ensure they are consistently carried out without providing so much detail as to end up with violations of the procedure because of normal variations in working. I think that's a, a great way to put it. So we're back to compliance. Um, compliance really just means you abide by and follow your standard operating procedure. And really what you need to know is that just having a written SOP is not enough. You have to actually follow the SOP or comply with it. And compliance requires training. People cannot comply with an SOP if they are not aware of what the SOP tells them to do and compliance requires access. If you cannot access the SOP so that you can read it and refer to it, again, you won't know how to perform the procedures. You won't even know that you need to perform the procedures. And compliance requires documentation. And I like to think of documentation uh, from two different perspectives. One, you need documentation that somebody was trained on the SOP. And also, there should be documentation that the SOP was followed. So for example, if your SOP requires a approval from the sponsor before you um, perform final coding tasks, then you would need to produce an approval form that shows that the sponsor did actually sign off. So again, you need to have training, access, and documentation. SOPs have a life cycle. SOPs tend not to be static documents. Our processes and technology in the clinical research area are changing constantly, and because of that, our SOPs need to change so that they describe the current practice. So SOPs typically uh, go through a cycle with, of creation, then they are approved, individuals train on them, and then if the SOP stays uh, static without changes, the employee will review that SOP annually. Um, if it changes, then they will have to review the revised SOP. And the SOP itself is typically reviewed annually or every two years just to make certain that the procedures outlined in it are still valid and still what we do. 
So there's that aspect of um, review of the employee does to make sure they know the SOP, and then the review that a corporation does to make sure that the SOP is still valid. Training is another one of those areas where you're probably going to sense that I have a theme going. I've mentioned with several of the um, modules that some you need to have your documentation and your training in place before a task is performed. So in other words, you don't have somebody go out and uh, do an SAEAE reconciliation and then train them after. You train them before so they know how to do the job. So training needs to occur before the task is performed. In most cases, people want training to, um, or the expectation is that training will be repeated annually or whenever a new version of an SOP is implemented. So I actually go and read SOPs uh, well, throughout the year. In fact, I'm doing a set of data management file audits this week, and I have pulled all the SOPs related to data transfers, and I'm reviewing them so I can make certain I'm familiar with the documentation that is supposed to be filed in the SOP or in the data management file to prove that we follow the SOP. So um, in most companies are going to have a policy that say you need to review your SOPs annually and document you reviewed them. And whenever a new version is released of the SOP, then you need to train on that new version as well. Because that's a lot of training and a lot of documentation, many companies have notification and tracking systems in place. And if they are not able to purchase a, an electronic system that does that for them, they might just set annual review dates and say, hey, it's SOP week. We're all going to pull out our SOPs and review them this week. So you need to have a set review cycle. You also need to document that the training on the SOPs occurred, and you can either do that through written or electronic signature, particularly if you've got a notification or tracking system that's electronic. That's the best way to go. If you're working with paper, then you can simply use a log like this SOP training log here where you know um, what the SOP is. You have the SOP title, the version number. You have the date the training occurred, and you actually sign it with a little pin. So what do we train people on when it comes um, to SOPs and to product-specific documents and work instructions? Well, first you have to figure out who needs to be trained on what. And essentially, you need to look at the role an individual performs and the task that they are going to be responsible for in that role. For example, if you are a clinical coder, then you need to know how to perform all of the coding activities. If you are a programmer who supports clinical coding, you need to understand the um, testing of the Thesaurus system and the relationship that the coders have to it. So first you identify the role. Within the role, you look at the tasks that role is going to be performing. And then it helps to create a matrix where you actually map out roles to tasks to SOPs. When you do that, you then can look at what SOPs are associated with the task and role, what department operating instructions or work instructions are associated with that task and role, and then what study-specific instructions that role entails as well or needs to be aware of. You, for study-specific training, you really want to um, make sure everybody understands the protocol. They need to read it. They need to have an idea of the indication and what the purpose of the study is. They need to be familiar with the case report form. They need to have a working knowledge of the contract or scope of work documents so they know what their deliverables are. And they um, generally, in data management, you want them to be aware of the data management plan and any project-specific instructions. So that's what people need to be trained on, and all that training has to be documented. So when we're talking about validation, just as when we were talking about SOPs, we need to be aware that we validate because it is required. It's a regulatory requirement. For validation, ICHE 6 5.5.3 states that um, when you are going to be handling data electronically, you need to perform validation to make certain that your system is reliable and accurate.
Uh, the FDA defines validation as establishing documented evidence which provides a high degree of assurance that a specific process will consistently produce a product meeting its predetermined specifications and quality attributes. And I have to kind of close that loop there and say, remember we're, we're not defining what those quality attributes are. The FDA is saying that you need to make certain that it is fit for purpose and that can change on a project by project basis. So little little fallback to fit for purpose for quality use. And as we discussed earlier with SOPs, um, we validate because it's a regulatory requirement, but we also validate because it makes good quality sense. You need to go through the validation process to ensure that your system is actually doing what you want it to do, or at the end of the trial you might find out that your data is worthless. So regulatory requirement and common sense, but it is a lot of work. So what is non-case report form data? Well, the most common types are coming in from what we call central or core labs. And in this case, it's not core like you drilled a core into something. It is that they are the core, um, the core source that all the data goes into. And what we receive from these labs in data management are data sets. We don't import those data sets back into the clinical database, but we have the clinical data sets, database data sets, and these um, central lab data sets existing in the same computer system, and we run programs to compare them, and this process is called reconciliation. And what you're looking to see is that for every patient in the clinical database, you have the associated laboratory data and for every patient for whom you have received laboratory data, that you also have that same patient in your clinical database. So you're really reconciling to make sure that you have the same patients in the data sets. So what are some common types of non-CRF data? Well, uh, you'll hear a lot about central laboratory data, and this is basically hematology, your analysis, blood, you know, your blood chemistry panels. Um, so that's your central lab. Some common central labs are LabCorp and um, Covance. You know, these, these groups basically have a tr clinical trials protocol. They contract with CROs and drug companies that are running clinical trials. You send all your lab samples to them, and then they send a data set to you so that you can reconcile to your clinical database. Uh, another very common central lab is an uh, MRI lab. Um, also ECG labs, Holter monitoring labs, you know, any place where you can have the sample read and then have a data set created on that and the data set is sent back to us. Um, also, you can think of uh, IVRS and IWRS data coming in that way, if voice recognition or web-based data coming in. This could be uh, randomization data, it could be patient diary data, it could be questionnaires. So it's really anything that's coming in through a voice recognition system or a web system. And once again, you don't actually put that data into your clinical database. You create a data set and then you compare the two. So the common data management activities to all of these are essentially importing the data in and then reconciling it, looking to see if you have the same patients in both sets of data, um, and then managing the queries that might arise while you are doing your reconciliation. So how do you do a reconciliation? Well, first let's look at the process and then we'll look at what we actually compare. Uh, some of the PowerPoints that I've posted are PowerPoints on actually doing the reconciliation process and I think those will give you some really good detailed examples. But for an overview, you have to define the import process first. You have to agree with the central lab what the data they're sending you is going to look like, how often you're going to get that data, what the data fields are going to look like, and what they're going to be named. So you're going to define the process of importing the data. You also have to define the reconciliation process up front. And again, I know you're probably hopefully not getting sick of hearing this, but are coming to expect it. You have to define the process up front. You can't wait and write it down at the end after you've done it. Then, once you have your import process and your re reconciliation process documented, you actually import the data. 
Then you compare the two data sets, whatever you've imported against your clinical database, and you look for differences or discrepancies between the two, and then you resolve those discrepancies either by fixing your database or fixing the central lab's data. What do you compare? Well, typically you're looking at patient identifiers. You want to make sure, again, that both that the patients exist in both places, that you don't have any patients that are in one data set but not in another data set. Also, you're looking at visit dates. And you look at visit dates because the, um, the central labs were supposed to be done at particular points throughout the, the study. And you are really looking, if you think about your visit schedule, your visit matrix, where we could say, okay, we're going to do um, blood chemistry at visits 2, 4, and 8, then you should be able to find laboratory data for each patient for their visit 2, 4, and 8. So you're going to compare patient identifiers and visit dates. Also, laboratory samples uh, are, have to be tracked, just like we track case report form data. And what they will do, for the most part, is assign either an accession or requisition number that is a unique identifying number for that sample or that record. And you can often enter the accession number in your clinical database and then compare that as well to give you another layer of comparison. If you don't have the accession and requisition number in both data sets, then you're essentially just QCing or reconciling your patient identifiers and your visit dates.